Um, Adrian Lee, uh, B. Eng, um, principal and founder of Epoch Environmental Consulting. Um, uh, he brings over 33 years of experience in the asbestos and hazardous materials field. Uh, Adrian completed the HERA, a HERA, Building Inspector and Management Certifications at the University of Berkeley. Adrian has extensive experience working with WorkSafe BC and hands-on experience in abatement and remediation. Adrian, welcome to the uh, to our Express Week. Um, you are off to the races. The screen is yours. Great. Well, thank you. Hello uh, to everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to first extend my uh, thanks to Chris for arranging this informative sessions for you all um, on the subject of asbestos and lead faced by most trades today uh, in the construction industry. Second, I'd like to also thank all the members of the National Floor Covering Association for participating in today's event. Um, and last but not least, I want to also add, if, uh, if time permits, uh, if we have time, hopefully I can answer some of your questions. All right, so without ado, uh, we'll start with this informative, informative session for you. All right, so the objective today is just to provide you with a general awareness of, of the knowledge of asbestos and lead in paints and coatings uh, related to the flooring uh, aspect of your work. Uh, we want to identify hazardous materials found in buildings that floor covering contractors may encounter alongside their work. Uh, so it's not just related to flooring sometimes that you're dealing with, but maybe even the materials that you have to remove prior to getting to the flooring. Uh, we'd like to inform you about the health hazards of asbestos and lead paint, just to let you know why there's such an importance in the construction industry now and why worker safety is, is a, a paramount uh, topic. Uh, we'd like to inform you on the purpose of what a risk assessment and exposure control plan is or a management plan uh, related to these materials. And that's it, let's move on. Uh, oh yeah, at, at the same time, I wanna to express what kind of services we provide as well. If you need any sort of consulting work or any testing uh, that's involved with your, the work that you're dealing with. All right, so asbestos, uh, the word originated from a Greek word, which means inextinguishable or fire resistant. It is a very um, unique material that uh, I don't know how they discovered it long, long ago, but it, it, it has these properties that uh, sort of like a wonder kind of product. Uh, it gets confused. A lot of people think that asbestos is a rock, but it really isn't. It is a, a fibrous mineral. Uh, it can be found in rock. It, it, it develops in there as a structure. Uh, some of the properties of asbestos is that it's resistant to heat and fire, and that's why it's a good insulator and fireproofing for uh, it's, it's use. Um, it's also resistant to corrosion or chemicals. Um, a lot of chemical labs use uh, cement, asbestos cement board to, um, to prevent uh, corrosion of chemicals that they use. Uh, it also possesses a high tensile or bendable strength. That meaning that they can use it into composite materials. So if you, if you look at it being fibrous and you put it in a composite material with sort of powder or sand, it helps it bond and it helps it gives a little more strength in, in the bending capacity. So Adrian, question for you, is it naturally occurring? It is naturally occurring. Nothing to do with manufacture and-, and... Not at all. It's just found, yeah, it's naturally, it's just found like any other uh, substance in the ground, chemicals. Um, it's, and it's not, a, it's not an element, it's a combination of substances? Correct. Okay, thanks. So there are six types of asbestos and uh, the most commonly uh, types of, of asbestos that are found in, in uh, composite materials or products are chrysotile, amosite, and chrysotile. There is a, a material called actinolite and tremolite, which is found in vermiculite insulation that has been used widely in uh, home attic insulation. And then there's anthophyllite, uh, which is infrequently used, but it does exist as part of the family. Uh, some historical use of asbestos, um, good old lamp wicks in uh, oil was used back in 4000 BC. The Egyptian pharaohs were wrapped in asbestos cloth, uh, tablecloth, 
In the first crusade, they used these uh, catapult bags that they lit with flaming tar in the warfare uh, aspect of the war. Uh, it was even used as uh, banknotes uh, because you can combine it with paper and you can make paper out of it. And then in the 1900s, um, they started developing a lot of composite building materials. We've got over 10,000 products now. Common materials containing asbestos. So what uh, the trades that are in the construction industry are facing now is a lot of drywall uh, joint compound. The drywall itself does not contain asbestos, but the compound that they use to cover the nail holes or the joints are uh, containing asbestos. Plaster. The yeah, the mud. Uh, plaster as well as stucco on the exterior of a building. Uh, you have decorative texture surface coats, uh, stuff that from popcorn ceilings to uh, troweled texture on the walls, decorative. You've got uh, mechanical insulation on pipes and boilers. We have insulation in attics and walls. Uh, and, and a lot of the old buildings, uh, including the Twin Towers in the United States, um, structural fireproofing. And then, of course, related to the topic here, flooring. You know, we have a lot of flooring materials where it's in, it's in vinyl floor tiles, sheet flooring, linoleum. Uh, it's in, inclusive of also the adhesive or the glue or mastic that you apply these uh, flooring materials to. And again, like on the concrete surface, you know, no concrete surface is always uh, flat and level. So leveling compound is used as well. And then one other thing, uh, subfloor liners. And subfloor liners are used in usually wood frame buildings where they're trying to assist in giving it a fire rating. And they put a, a paper liner between the subfloor uh, between two levels of the building. I think, let me comment, I, I think, uh... I'm at high risk of dying from asbestos in a few days time because I don't know how many popcorn ceilings I've scraped off and how much exposure to vermiculite that that um, uh, roofing attic insulation. Um, yeah, it's just very concerning. Well, well, that was back in the day. We didn't care. We just like got on with the job, got covered in dust and went home and drank beer. Yes, yes. And, you know, vermiculite was uh, uh, it was fairly new in its discovery. It wasn't till about maybe 15 years ago that they include vermiculite insulation. And the vermiculite insulation in itself does not contain asbestos, but where it was mined, uh, where it started was in Montana, um, there was trace contamination of asbestos minerals uh, with the vermiculite, and that's why it's in that insulation. Uh, so the product itself might not contain, because we all associate vermiculite with asbestos. So it's only where it was sourced from that had the trace residue, that's what you're saying. Correct. So randomly, it could have come with the product, but you just don't know. So you just and that, that product was deleted from uh, uh, you couldn't buy it anymore as a result, right? Correct. OK, interesting. Uh, asbestos use in Canada. OK, so in 1879, the, the first mine was opened uh, in Quebec. There is uh, 10 out of 10 out of the 13 mines originated from Quebec. Other mines followed too, like BC, uh, British Columbia has the Cassiar mines as well as the Yukon has one there in, in Newfoundland. In 1979, uh, when they just started discovering the health ramifications with this materi material, uh, Canada officially banned the production and manufacturing of asbestos-containing products. Uh, started with fireproofing first. Uh, 2012, last asbestos mine closes in Quebec. So even though um, asbestos was banned in, uh, in 1979, um, Quebec was the only province that still uh, remained uh, mining uh, asbestos and selling it to third world countries, but uh, that was cut off last in 2012. Uh, 2018, Canada prohibits the use, sale, import, and export of all asbestos containing products because of the fact that uh, third world countries still use asbestos in their products, and therefore things like in, uh, products from India and China uh, makes its way here to Canada. So uh, we do have Health Canada or the Health Product Act of Canada uh, auditing these materials. Let's just go back to an earlier slide. You, you mentioned different types of asbestos, maybe, maybe five different types? Six different types. Six. But the three commonly used ones are chrysotile, amosite, and chrysotile. Are they all as bad for your health as each other or one is yes, one worse? All, they, they are all equally bad. I mean, at one time uh, back in the early 1990s, they had 
classified uh, the severity of each type, but now they've made it consistently the same. They're all dangerous. And what's different about them? The, the shape of the particles, the, the, the effect they have on your lungs? That's a very, very good question. Uh, out of the six, there, um, we, there's two types of structures uh, with asbestos. One is called a serpentine, and the other one's called an amphibole. A serpentine sounds like a serpent, so it's snaky and it's curly. And uh, amphiboles are straight fibers. Uh, they're like sticks. So the only one that is uh, curly is chrysotile. And so it was at, at that time considered less dangerous than the other, the other five because of the fact that when you have curly fibers, they kind of bind together. And so when they bind together, they're heavier. And if they're heavier, they settle. But with uh, amphiboles or, or needle-like, fiber-like, uh, it gets airborne, uh, the, the individual fibers doesn't stick to anything. So it stays in the air much longer. And so once they get into your lungs, whether it's a serpentine shape or a stick shape, it doesn't matter. It's going to lodge itself in your in your tissue and do the damage. Correct. Because asbestos uh, can break down so small, it can actually pass your own natural filtration system in your body that it does enter through to your lungs and then it does penetrate. It doesn't matter whether it's curly edge or, or, or a curly fiber or a straight fiber. When it gets down to that small of a length, uh, it's still a straight fiber. Uh, and I've heard rumors or talk of uh, one particle can set off the cancer. Well, theoretically, they, they say that one fiber is, is all it takes. But I mean, statistically, it's shown that um, most exposures and most people who contracted uh, asbestos diseases are usually long-term exposure. Long-term, yeah. yeah. All right. So... Uh, <laughs> Due to this, there was a federal asbestos ban, asbestos ban in 79, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and asbestos is still identified in building built in late 1980s. So, you know, even though it was banned in 1979, a lot of the products were still in retailers and stuff like that, or, or wholesalers. So the product was still being used past 1979. So we've, I think, uh, currently we've found products up to 1986 that are still present. Uh, here's a, one of our regulatory board, WorkSafe BC. They, in their publications, they put a house here, and you can see that um, there's a lot of different kinds of products that contain asbestos, from right from the roofing felts and shingles on your roof to the insulation on your attic, to your your ceiling tiles, to flooring, drywall, plaster, uh, paper tape. Now, the definition of asbestos-containing materials uh, it depends on on each province. Um, the, the typical in the United States and Canada, the definition of asbestos containing material is any material containing 1% or more asbestos. However, in British Columbia, they decided to amp it up and they actually went down to 0.5%. So in British Columbia, it's the only province that I know of right now that stipulates an asbestos containing material is any material with asbestos of 0.5%. So flooring material, let's just go through a bunch of materials so that people understand what they're dealing with. Um, first of all, with flooring, you have the vinyl floor tiles and composite tiles. There's many forms, linoleum backing, sheath flooring, floor liners or barriers, the mortar, the grout, the leveling compound. And, you know, in a lot of these old tiles, you can see that from the pictures, they're quite gaudy. I mean, most of these were back in 1970s and the hippie days. And you can see that there's full of colors to it. Uh, the size of the tiles are ranging from 9 inch by 9 inch to 12 inch by 12 inch. And you'll find that a lot of the flooring sometimes are multiple layers. So even though some people sometimes look at a flooring that might be newer on top, uh, they're not considering the fact that it could have been overlain and, and there's old tiles below or, yeah, or even linoleum flooring. Uh, flooring materials that do not contain asbestos is things that we, we can associate with that is solid. So we have a solid wood floor, there's no asbestos. Manufactured laminates are usually a composite of flooring materials, uh, wood materials. So no, that doesn't contain it. Natural stone or marble like slate and stuff like that, they do not contain asbestos. However, there might be some natural uh, presence of lead in them. Uh, concrete does not typically contain asbestos. However, there are concrete uh, or cement pipes and boards that are made with asbestos, but typically concrete, surf, uh, concrete floors on foundations do not contain asbestos. Uh, ceramics, 
ceramic uh, flooring, ceramic tiles, they do not contain asbestos. However, that's what you would have to consider for lead containing coatings or glazings. And we'll be speaking a little bit more about lead after this. Uh, metals, glass, plastics do not contain asbestos. Um, mastics uh, and leveling compound and adhesive. So it's not only the tiles that you're, the flooring material that you're looking at, but also the adhesives that, that are putting it to the ground. Um, in a sheet flooring or linoleum, they usually a yellow color adhesive. Um, flooring mask, uh, floor tiles, they usually use more of a, a black tarish mastic. And then a lot of areas sometimes that uh, we've dealt with hospitals where they had leveling compound underneath the level of floor and uh, laid over by a big sheet flooring. So those things can be missed out. Now here's a picture of an asbestos paper liner. Now this paper liner is underneath a hardwood floor. And this has a high content of asbestos. It's about um, 60 to 80% asbestos, so it's quite high. And you, you, you don't necessarily find it underneath a, a hardwood floor. We typically find that you know, between layers of a subfloor uh, between two floor levels uh, for fire protection. Now, asbestos can also be present in wallboard systems like drywall compounds and plasters. So when you're doing your flooring system, sometimes uh, you, you're encountering that you have to remove some, some wall boards. Sometimes the baseboard is off uh, the bottom and the, you might have joint compounds that are loose and, 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 and uh, debris from that on, on your flooring. And then you're encountering that while you're working. Um, it's fireproofing. I mean, this is the kind of fireproofing that was on the Twin Towers that came down in the United States. Um, it's present here in Vancouver uh, throughout a lot of the old, old towers. Uh, then you have auditoriums like schools and you have um, uh, schools and theaters where they have sound dampening and absorptions for, for music or whatever it may be. And then we have industrial uses like pipe insulation on mechanical insulation on boilers, hot water tanks, HVAC ducts, texture coat, popcorn ceilings, stipple coats. These could be on walls or ceilings. And then there's a whole variety of other stuff. Uh, you know, uh, you got electrical wiring. Even in the old houses, you can see in the top picture there, there's electrical wiring that's covered with an asbestos jacketing. Uh, a lot of the ducts, uh, HVAC or the heating ducts in homes have paper duct tape, and that's also high content. Now, with that in mind, I mean, obviously we've talked about so much about asbestos, but so what? Well, asbestos, uh, like I said to you, um, it can break down to small fibers that could penetrate your respiratory system and therefore it can go into your lungs. And with that, um, the three associated diseases that come along with long-term exposure to asbestos is asbestosis, uh, lung cancer and mesothelemia. Now, the video I'm gonna play for you is asbestosis. Uh, but mesothelemia is uh, basically um, a cancer that grows in the lining of your lungs and your stomach. So uh, it's quite, Quite dangerous, but here I'll play this video here for you and some publications on work safety showing you what is best known. Can anybody hear this? Yeah. Asbestos is a fibrous mineral that's resistant to chemicals and heat and very tough. It was also added to the building materials of many older homes. As a worker or homeowner, the hazard exists when undertaking a renovation or demolition. The danger is releasing the asbestos fibers into the air. When a worker breathes, asbestos fibers enter the mouth and nose and flow down the air passages deep into the lungs. The fibers lodge in the delicate lung tissue where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells try and break down the asbestos fibers and become damaged and die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more fibers embed in the lungs. Asbestos fibers can remain in the lungs for long periods 
and the scar tissue that results continues to develop for many years after exposure. Eventually, so much scar tissue develops that the lungs stop working. Since the year 2000, more workers have died from asbestos disease in BC than any other workplace injury. For information on how to protect yourself from asbestos exposure. So uh, that being said, uh, you know, the, the comment about the 2000, uh, since 2000 is one of the highest death rates or accidents in the workplace. It is true for those who had installed asbestos back in the 1970s. Again, asbestos is a latent disease, meaning that uh, after exposure, most people contract a disease after 15 to 35 years. And therefore, anyone who had used asbestos during the 1970s, uh, by the time 2000, they are now reacting to it. So the whole idea with this education is to prevent the opposite, where trades are now removing uh, asbestos materials and uh, are being exposed uh, to avoid the next 25 to 30 years of having the same repeated kind of statistics. Uh, regulation performed after knowing that these health effects were related to asbestos. Uh, the federal uh, part of, of Canada, uh, it, it handles with the transport of, of dangerous goods, which asbestos is included, as well as lead. Um, the provincial, each uh, province regulate asbestos exposure independently. So it's something that you would have to consult with your own provincial uh, body to find out what their regulation is in respect to exposure. And then we have the municipal level. Uh, some, some municipalities are implementing prerequisites for demolition or any renovation work. Uh, and so they implement permit systems that you would have to submit a hazardous material report indicating what is present that you're, you're dealing with before um, you can get a permit to proceed with the work. Uh, the asbestos management plan was implemented in most regulatory boards. Mm -hmm. They they use it to identify hazardous materials, and it's it's basically to provide instructions on how to manage them, especially for workers in in a building. Uh, every building owner is supposed to maintain a current inventory of of hazardous materials, including asbestos and lead. So it's not just uh, asbestos and lead; it could be many many other uh, uh, chemicals and stuff that may be present. Um, most companies should have an exposure control plan. In British Columbia, we have that. All companies, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, uh, an office office company or, uh, or a certain trade or a hospital, everybody has to have an exposure control plan in, 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 in relation to what you may be exposed to. So if there's asbestos and lead is present, then therefore you have to add that to your exposure control plan. Uh, the exposure control plan includes a risk assessment, and that's something that what we do uh, as a consultant. So we provide that. We come in, we inspect the area, we test the materials, and then we write your report letting you know uh, what is there. And we tell you the risk level that it's at and what, what you have to do, what kind of procedures that you're required to remove it safely before you do any other work. Um, it also outlines safe work procedures. I mean, we if you're going to be removing this stuff, you'll need to implement safe work procedures to remove it. And then also uh, the management plan is to educate and train people so that they're aware of what is present in the building. So in, in BC, we have building owners that have their, their, their maintenance, maintenance person there that's trained. When a, a trade comes in, they usually provide them with the information of what they have and inventory. Uh, if there's something that a trade needs to do, then they're the ones that make the arrangements to either get a qualified asbestos contractor to remove the asbestos uh, before you attempt to do your work. How's it tested? Um, asbestos is a mineral. Again, like I said, it's a fibrous mineral. It's collected. It goes to a lab. They use a microscope. The type of uh, procedure that they use is called a polarized light microscopy. Uh, they use a dispersion staining technique where they, they, they first have to search and find a fiber, and then they put it under another microscope where they look for a color association to it. As you can see that this one here uh, is blue, and uh, depending on which type of asbestos, they exhibit their own colors, and that's how they identify whether it's asbestos or not. Okay, let's move on to lead paint coating awareness. So lead is a naturally occurring uh, bluish grayish metal that is soft, malleable, corrosion resistant, and very easy to, to melt and form into many things. Uh, lead has multiple uses in products. Uh, in the 1980s, lead was used in paint 
And the reason why they use lead in paint was to increase its durability. Uh, it also allows colors to be more vibrant and it also helps paint dry faster. Uh, they also introduced that as well in, in glazing on tiles, uh, ceramic tiles so that you can have your patterns and your colors that you need. Uh, lead is still paint, uh, lead and paint is still used today. Uh, you know, there's nothing that we can say is lead free. There's always a little trace of lead in it. And so therefore uh, lead is still tested. New lead, I mean, new, new ceramics are tested. Uh, potential sources of lead, of course, surface paints, mainly in pre-1970 homes, uh, ceramic tiles where the glaze, and that can be any date. I mean, even today at present, uh, products coming from China, we have tested for lead. Uh, metal pipes and fixtures, plastic toys, and that's why the Canada Health Product Act limits the fact that lead, lead products come into Canada so kids do not suck on toys and get poisoned. Uh, are all lead containing materials hazardous? Well, yes and no. Uh, if the lead paint is intact uh, and it doesn't create a dust, then therefore it's not a hazard. However, if it becomes um, damaged and dust is allowed to accumulate, then therefore it would be hazardous. How is uh, lead affected by us? And how's it, what's its, its avenue of getting into us is basically in, by ingestion and inhalation uh, by the dust. And you know when you when you're dealing with lead materials, especially like lead on wood wood surfaces like windows, when when windows are opened and closed, it rubs and rubs back and forth, and it causes uh, lead dust. Uh, types of substrates it's, it's applied on to many things: brick, concrete, drywall, metal, plaster, wood. Now, its potential health effects. Well, once it's in your bloodstream through ingestion and inhalation, um, it can cause multiple health problems. Some of them are headaches, fatigue, insomnia, high blood pressure, irritability, achy joints and muscles, anemia, lowered IQ and forgetfulness, uh, re reproductive problems, birth defects, learning and memory disabilities. Uh, that sounds like old age to me, but I mean, uh, not all at once. How is lead detected in the body? Well, blood test, obviously. Um, you would have to do a extract blood and they would test how much lead is in your blood. And usually in a normal normal case, uh, the blood level for an adult is about less than 0 0.1 micromoles. Um, if you were poisoned with lead, and it's very easy to get poisoned by lead, your, your blood levels can go between two and four micromoles. Uh, if blood lev uh, lead levels exceed greater than 0.48 micromoles, uh, then you have an exposure problem and it should be minimized and you should be wearing protective measures uh, to avoid that. So uh, uh, Adrian, what, at what level does it become a significant health hazard or, or might you die as a result? 0.48. 0.48, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're at 0.1 when we're- at, So you, at can be, you can be categorized as having been poisoned by it, but not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna die. Exactly. The higher the level, the higher the level it becomes. I mean, the the effects are greater, right? Um, when so when you have a high, pardon me. You you might just feel ill and fatigued and. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we know you know and there's there's cases where children um, get very ill from exposure from high levels of exposure. And one of the things that is not good is you know for mostly for children and for pregnant women. Um, so, you know, with that, regulations were also created for that. And Health Canada gives priority to consumer products because, you know, if we can avoid it coming into the country, uh, then it's less for, for anyone to get exposed, especially children products, right? Uh, toys and stuff like that. The, can, the Canadian uh, Consumer Product Safety Act sets out a, a, a standard of 90 milligrams or 90 ppms uh, total lead content in, um, in, any, in any product that comes into Canada. Uh, the Federal Service Coding Material Regulation prohibits the sale of importation of products with lead concentration exceeding 90 ppm. 90 ppm is, is fairly low, like it's almost non-detectable. So it's a pretty high standard that uh, the Canadian government has established for, for lead products coming into Canada now. Uh, the provincial lead regulations vary from province to province again, uh, and that's related to workers' exposure uh, with their health and safety regulations. Uh, Alberta labor and maybe not just so much as workers compensation board, but you know, there's labor, labor regulatories as well. 
How is lead tested? Well, there are two methods. We have one that we can do in situ, meaning on site, and that's a portable XRF analysis. <laughs> we use a lead gun, and uh, it's basically a point and shoot. It will tell us uh, what kind of content of lead is in the in the in the material. The ray beams hit the lead, and it bounces back to the gun, and they get a reading. Uh, the other one is uh, through a FAA, what we call flame atomic absorption or a spectrometer. Uh, that's an in lab. And that one that they break the material down and then they put it into a light and then they, they, they calculate the concentration of lead inside that product. Uh, TCPL, uh, TCLP testing for lead. Now, this testing is separate from doing uh, lead ident identification. So the first one that you just saw there was to do with identifying lead presence. This one here is for lead disposal. So even though you, when, you, when you find a material that has lead, well, how much lead can you dispose it as regular waste and how much lead can you, that you, that you dispose that have to go into a special waste uh, landfill? So the, the testing is a separate test from the identification and anytime that you're gonna be disposing products with lead, you're supposed to do a TCLP test. And the limit is, you know, with the EPA, the US EPA and Canada, most provinces is five milligrams per liter. So if it's below that, you know, you can just throw it out in the garbage. If it's higher than that, then it has to go for special waste treatment. Uh, ceramic tiles is the only one that ex is exempt from special waste disposal. And that's depending on province. We know that BC, that if you remove ceramic tiles, um, it can be disposed as regular waste. However, the transport of it and, 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 and the abatement of it uh, will be probably put in bags and then you take it to the landfill and you just drop it there. Uh, now, how is lead risk determined? It's usually determined uh, not by the content itself, but the, the activity that you're, you're doing. How much dust are you creating? You may be able to remove ceramic tiles in larger chunks than you would, or maybe sometimes it'll break into several, several pieces, and therefore you can create more airborne dust. Risk assessments. Uh, with asbestos and lead, both have to have a risk assessment before any demolition of the material. So a uh, risk assessment evaluates, first we look at the condition. Is, is it broken? Is it intact? Uh, we look at friability. It's a terminology uh, we call uh, when you can break a material with the pressure of your hand and create dust, that's friability. So if we were to break up a ceiling tile, that's easy with our hands, we can make that airborne. But if we were to crush a floor tile, we consider that non-friable because we, we couldn't break that into dust with our hands. We could break that with a, a machine or a jackhammer. And if we do that, then it'd be considered as friable. Again, we look at accessibility too. I mean, with asbestos, if the asbestos is up in the ceiling, like the popcorn ceiling, and we're not even doing any work there, it's not a risk. Uh, likelihood of damage. We always look at what's the potential for it being damaged so that it could cause an issue for workers. And therefore, I mean, uh, most companies should include asbestos and lead in their exposure control plan that they have for mm -hmm. their, their safety policy. Um, they should be identifying stuff like if they run into this material, what they should be doing, testing it, to identify it, and if there's anything that needs to be done with it and how are they gonna handle it. Now, most of this work is usually done by a qualified professional in the field. So before, you know, involving any asbestos or lead, uh, the property owner is the one that's typically responsible to uh, to provide this information to you. It's not necessary. I mean, all, you know, it, it's the employer that's work that's employing the worker to do the work uh, should be looking into this stuff uh, if if the owner is not present. Um, uh, occupational health and safety professional is best to be used. They can help you with the practice of proper hygiene. And when we say hygiene, we're not talking about dental hygiene, we're talking about safety. Uh, so they can help with the management of asbestos. So you'll probably want to choose a qualified or certified abatement professional to help you with the removal of any asbestos or lead that you encounter, but it's not necessary. A lot of uh, companies now have, can do it in-house. Uh, we have different risk levels uh, when it comes down to asbestos and flooring is considered uh, moderate risk and therefore uh, it is possible for contractors uh, in the trade of flooring do their own work. 
The property owner is responsible, like I said again, uh, he must ensure that asbestos or lead is tested. Uh, and if they have an inventory in their building, they would have uh, information for the trade. Uh, some places they're identified by labels. It's part of the regulation here in BC. I'm not too sure about the other provinces, but I'm sure it's the same. Uh, most places are identified with labels telling you there's asbestos in the pipe insulation and stuff. It's not common to have it on drywall or flooring. So therefore, it's a question to be asked at all times when you're going to be doing work with it. Okay, so uh, all I can end with this is that EPOC Environmental is the consulting division of, uh, of asbestos and lead, and we also do mold. Um, we are serving British Columbia. We do all the inspections and testing, and we help write procedures and specifications. Uh, EPOC Analytical is our wing, uh, our testing wing. They provide analytical, analytical service. We, they, can, they can analyze samples from throughout Canada. Uh, we have two locations in British Columbia, but you can mail, mail the uh, samples to us and we can identify it for you. And that's it. Thank you, Chris. Is there any right. questions that uh, anyone has? Let's, uh, let's ask yep. the floor. Any questions for uh, Adrian? This is a very constructor or general contractor centric topic. Um, yeah, if, if they need any more information, feel free to contact us. We can always give them more specific information and, and assist. So don't hesitate to contact our office. We'll always be available to assist anyone um, with their needs or if they run into something, we can answer questions, no problem. Adrian, you said you were active in Alberta as well in the past and Ontario. Much of the, is much of the information here applicable there? Did you see many yes. differences? Yes, it's quite, it's quite universal. When we talk about uh, a difference between province, it's just about their classification. We might call it low, moderate, high here. Some provinces might call it level one, level two, level three. Uh, just minor, minor differences. I mean, most of our regulations are an adaptation from the United States. I think the United States are a, a bigger founder of this topic. And so therefore Canada has adopted a lot. We do have a, a person in Ontario called Dr. Pynchon. He was one of the lead um, uh, lead experts in asbestos with the schools. He did a royal commission in uh, in Ontario for schools with asbestos. So yeah, no, it's pretty universal throughout each province. So here's a, a question: um, If I'm a renovator <clears throat> and I'm now working on a, a home, I, I put my budget together and I walk right into asbestos. Now I've got to abate asbestos, which I didn't count, uh, account for. Is there a, a, an average cost to abate asbestos from a typical single family dwelling? Well, it depends on the material. Um, of course, uh, there are unit rates that are provided by most contractors to let you know what it would cost. For an example, if you were to do drywall removal, uh, it's about four to $5 a square foot. Uh, but it varies depending on the quantity. So it's really hard to say, but uh, an average home, if I was to remove all the drywall uh, in a building, a typical house with about four or 5,000 square feet of drywall, you're looking around $20,000. If you're removing from a light insulation in an attic space, you can be anywhere between 10 to $15,000. Uh, flooring, uh, again, linoleum goes into a high risk category and therefore it entails showers and it's much more stringent and air monitoring as well. It can go from a small kitchen of 100 square feet for about 3,500 to, 3, to $5,000. And a bathroom can be anywhere between $1,500 to $2,500. But it's really hard to say, you know, you yeah. have to ask one of your local professionals. Yeah, I, I understand. It's like, how long is a piece of string? I, but I appreciate that gives you a sort of a, 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 a wide ballpark figure of what you're sort of dealing with. This is a something really to plan for. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't and you run into it, you're going to lose significant margin on your project. So based on, you know, being a flooring, this is related to flooring. I mean, removing floor tiles, um, the typical unit rate cost for that ranges around 250 to $3 a square foot. Of course, there's going to be a minimum uh, established by a contractor. You might have 100 square feet and they're not going to come in unless they're, you know, have a minimum cost of $2,000. But I mean, if you're doing large scales with that I've managed many like in shopping centers and Walmarts and stuff like that. When you're dealing with tens of thousands of square feet, you're looking around 
anywhere between two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents a square foot. It gets lower as the quantity increases. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Well, last chance for questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I thank everybody for your time. Thank you for listening to us. And uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, you may reach me at Epoch Environmental Consulting, and my name is Adrian Lee.